waiting for the projection to get all set up. So yeah, you're not first. I think we're first. Oh, you're first. Yeah. yeah okay, we have plenty of time for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, pardon. Uh, Do you say uh, that uh, they go first? Yeah. Uh, the, no, I think they're going first. I thought it was a coin flip. The Chris. debate rules didn't specify that panel A or B was determined. As a rule, we will not begin debating until the debate starts. Uh, oh. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what does that mean, Chris? It means. Uh, You'll be going first. Thank you. Did we do a coin flip, or well, you're just being here. gracious? <laughs> House rules. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. It's really an honor to have so many of you come out, you know, but I know this is also a subject that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. What we have here tonight is six men of honor, six men with the integrity to come out here and actually argue in a public arena for what they believe or what they do not believe. Now, uh, we're going to hear a lot of interesting things from both sides tonight. We're going to give everyone their opportunity to speak. And we've got a format here that I'll tell you about as to how this debate is going to go. First, for the Christians, Sai Ten Brukenkate is a member of the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. And by God's grace alone, he is a Christian. Pastor Jeff Durbin is the pastor of Apologia Church in Tempe, Arizona. And he was also Johnny Cage in the Mortal Kombat movies. Yes. <laughs> the tour, the tour. <laughs> also, Pastor Paul Vigiano has been the pastor of Branch of Hope Presbyterian Church. That's the church that you're in right now. In Torrance, California for 25 years. Now, for our atheist friends, Bruce Gleason is the founder of the Backyard Skeptics with over 1,400 members. He's the director of the Free Thought Alliance and supports the philosophy that one who lives a naturalistic and materialistic worldview uh, and has no supernatural beliefs will make better decisions about his or her life. He believes that people of faith unknowingly cause harm. Sean Taylor in the middle. Sean is an active member of the secular humanist, skeptic, and atheist communities in Southern California. He has since devoted much time into scholarly research on modern religions, the Bible, the Quran, and the philosophies and history surrounding them. Our third speaker on the end is Andrew Breeding, who recently graduated from Cal State Fullerton with a degree in philosophy specializing in ethics. His interests are computers, politics, and sushi. <laughs> Now, as for the format, you recognize that it's a bit unusual, and the reason for that is we don't have just one speaker speaking to one speaker. There really is a call in today's society to have the conversation openly, airing grievances and doing analysis. So we have three speakers for each side. Each speaker will get the opportunity to speak. The first speaker will speak an opening statement of 20 minutes, and the other side, all three of them, will have the opportunity to cross-examine. At the same time, if that speaker chooses to defer a question, he may ask either of his other partners to answer that question for him. Then the next speaker from the other side will have 20 minutes in the same format. Then the next speaker for side A will have a 15-minute rebuttal, uninterrupted, followed by a five-minute cross-examination by the other side. And then the other side will have the same opportunity. After that, there will be a 10-minute closing argument by each side, uninterrupted, giving a synopsis and their analysis of the content of the debate. After that, we will open up the floor for your comments and questions. Now, at this time, we would usually pray, but we don't want to give an unfair advantage to either side. <laughs> So at this time, we will uh, have our honored guest, Bruce Gleason, begin his direct arguments. Thanks for coming. I understand this is a conference over the weekend. Is this like uh, your entertainment instead of a big dance? 
I understand. I'd rather have a big party myself. Let's, let's just forget this and have a big party. No, okay, can't do that. Okay. Well, I'd like to take the temperature of the room here. How many Christians are here tonight? Raise your hands. How many atheists? Thank you for coming. Okay. How many young earth creationists are here? Christians that believe in a 6,000-year-old. How many Christians here believe in an old earth? 4.5 million, billion years old. Okay, just wanted to see where we're at right there. Before we go on, I need to explain what an atheist is. There's a lot of misconceptions of atheists. No, we're not baby eaters. That's from the South from years ago. Forget it. Um, an atheist assumes that there's no God, asserts that there's no God or gods. That's pretty much it. There's no agenda, no mantra, no dogma, no text. It's a secular humanist philosophy. Are there variations? Yes, there are variations. I happen to be in what's called an anti-theist. I promote atheism because I think it's a better worldview to live by. There's also strong atheists that say there is no God. There are soft atheists or weak atheists that say, I don't believe in a God. There might be a God. That's not agnosticism, that is atheism. There are two different things going on here. But I'm an atheist because I don't reject the Bible. It's because I read it. I have examined all the apologist arguments over the past 10 years and have not found one void of fallacy. I have gone on a quest to find the truth, and through the Socratic method of questioning, I have found it. And the truth for me is that the supernatural does not exist. Are we up there? Good. I'll take the first shot across the bow. Thank you, Sean, my loyal assistant. Sai will probably say that he knows that I really do believe in a God. That means he knows what's going on inside my head. And all of your heads as well. Not only that, it's extremely presumptuous and silly, but downright arrogant, I think. No one knows what's going on inside my head or anyone else here. When I say I don't believe in a God, he has no justification to tell me otherwise. Presuppositionalists start with the Bible and their own definition of God that conflicts with many other Christian sects out there and does not question. He will not give any evidence besides personal revelation and the Bible tonight. If he does, after the 25 debates that I've seen on YouTube, it'll be the first. Scientific skeptics like myself and atheists have a habit of doing just that, questioning, questioning everything and gladly admitting we don't know anything to be 100% true. We base our opinions on the probability that something is true based on evidence. It appears that Jeff and Sy are downright wrong because just because naturalistic philosophy does not obtain an absolute knowledge, it does not mean God did it. That's a false dichotomy, one of the many fallacies you might hear tonight. I hope you're up on your fallacies. Red herrings, special pleading. Presubs build a bridge to an island. They cross the bridge. Where's the bridge, Sean? Okay, time out. We're going to have to put a time out on our... Uh... Oh, go back. There it is. Thank you. Stay on top, si. uh, stay on top uh, Sean. They, uh, they cross a uh, bridge to the island, and then they burn the bridge. If they were 100% wrong, they wouldn't even know it. They are totally on the offensive and offer no defense whatsoever. With, they have offered defenses with, that withstands fallacies on top of fallacy. They try to turn difficult, philosophical, unresolved issues into insolvable, unresolvable issues. And listen for that tonight. This is not how philosophy works. Surprisingly, my opponents are actually going to argue against themselves tonight because any religion with any holy text can say the exactly the same thing that they are saying. I claim that logic and reason came from a natural evolutionistic uh, pr um, progress, but the difference is I have strong evidence from anthropology and, evidence and evolutionary psychology, and presuppositionalists have empty claims with zero evidence. So let's take a look at God's existence. Okay, here we go. We're on time. A good starting point is to examine if God, believe, uh, God exists is to start with the assumption of the null hypothesis. What is that? Not believing in God's existence. The reason we have to do this is because if we believe in a God told to us that existed, it would take more than a human's lifetime to examine all the different gods. If a Muslim was up here right now, you would probably think he was delusional. If a Hindu was up here, you probably thought he was mistaken. 
But an atheist differs from any believer in that we reject the belief in all gods. If I told you I believed in a God that you haven't heard about from this position, you would have to start at the null hypothesis because you wouldn't know anything about the God. Let's take a look at personal revelation, and this is a big one. Since the method of choice of how presuppositionalists gain knowledge, we are all humans, humans can be mistaken, therefore everyone on earth can be mistaken. This logical statement can be said by most everyone except for those strong in their supernatural beliefs so much that they do not know that they can be mistaken. If you are one of these people in this debate tonight, you might think about the possibility that you might be misled or possibly, possibly you have not examined the opposite opinion. And that's one of my best sayings tonight, my axiom. The best way to know what is true is to study the best argument against your opinion. The best way to know what is true. That's it. That's what we do as skeptics. It's my guess that my opposite, my opponents will say they cannot be delusional because they believe in a revelation from God just like every other person on earth that believes in a different God. This is a vacuous claim. Suppose you're a presuppositionalist and God gave you a revelation that you would call absolute knowledge, very much like they do, Then, and you were certain it was true. Then later you changed your mind because you found convincing evidence that this knowledge was untrue. Does this mean that God was wrong? More likely, it would be that they were misled, either by a malicious God or simply their own belief. If you believe that you misinterpreted God's word, what's to say you can't do it again? The presuppositionalists receive knowledge through what, excuse me, the presubs happened to receive knowledge through, uh, boy, I blew that one. <laughs> Can presubs receive knowledge about other things? like a medical, a medical degree, eight years of education. Pray and it'll be done. What type of knowledge is Sai and Jeff actually looking at? It's not called knowledge, it's just strong belief. Suppose that one person received revelation from a God and says it's knowledge, and the other person, or for a matter, 300 people, receive personal revelation that conflicts with that one person. Who's God's is it, uh, revelation is truly God's word. No one can tell. I think personal revelation is a very dangerous thing. You can do very bad things while thinking you will have immunity from any punishment because you're doing God's work. Here are some examples. Virginia Tech, 2007. His mother knew that he had psychological problems, and what did she do instead of go to a psychiatrist? She went to a minister and prayed. 32 children, kids, students are killed because she didn't have the right personal revelation. Andrea Yates, 2001, killed her four children because God told her to kill them, prevent, to prevent them from going to hell. Jim Jones, 1978, 300 people died because of his personal revelation. And finally, just last week, a 19-year-old was killed by his own pastor father. Back up, back up, Sean. I, I'm going to have to put on hold for a moment. There we go. Thank you, Sean. Parents arrested after 19-year-old, their son died. Just go through the next one, Sean, please. I don't think that we're working here. Something missing. Okay, we'll continue on. They beat him to death. Took two hours. His 17-year-old lived, and he was beaten almost to death by personal revelation in a church. War does the same thing. This is about war, Sean. We're okay now. Do two sides of war pray to each god? You might want to lower that down a little bit, Mr. Soundman. How about football games, Mr. Tebow? And this is the worst one. Allowing your child to, pray, to die. This is a little bit, oh boy. Some pictures did not come through. Okay, I'll pass that one up. Horrible things can happen when using this type of reasoning. Let's go to the attributes of God because that's really what this debate is about. The Christian's description of a God is one with no physical attributes. He has no matter, no energy. Yet his mind, he has a mind and can move things like planets, stars, mountains, and give men special revelations. But he has no matter energy. How does he actually do the work? How can there be a mind in total vacuous space? 
If God has special powers at work, wouldn't we see that in the universe with our most sensitive telescopes? But we don't see anything supernatural over of a 30, the 12 billion, excuse, excuse me, 13.5 billion years we've been around, we don't see any stars going faster than the speed of light. We don't see anything that breaks the laws of physics. And shouldn't the power be so great and God should be so easily seen because he's so powerful? We don't see God's power with our most sensitive scientific earth-based instruments that can discover the majesty of subatomic particles and even see into our brains. And it will be into the uh, subatomic, not the uh, subatomic, but uh, atomic particle shortly. God works in mysterious ways, they might say, but it's unreasonable to explain a mystery with another mystery. If God exists and is omniscient, he knows everything from the beginning of time. If he knew everything that was going to happen as told in the Bible, why does he seem so upset? Are we moving here, Sean? Thank you. And one more. One more, I think, Sean. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Uh, why does he seem so angry? God cannot be omniscient and omnipotent at the same time. This is going into a little bit of philosophy. But if God is unchanging, immutable, perfectly made the universe, it's a hands-off God. He can't have the power to change anything because that would be admitting he was wrong. He's immutable. He's non-changing. He set everything up. Did God create us humans knowing ahead of time that most of us would end up in hell? That God doesn't sound like a loving God to me. We should have the hell picture up there, Sean. What, would a loving God really kill nearly everyone on earth and call it love? Even Sai has previously agreed in other debates that this is not the loving God that most Christians believe in. What this sounds like is a story that is made up to instill fear in people made up so people will obey men's laws that are attributed to a so-called God? Would a just God offer a total ignorant man and woman the chance and we are stuck? Can I have a timeout, Christopher? We are stuck. Christopher and uh, the AV guy. I'm praying really hard. It's not working. Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll take a one-minute break. Okay, now on the left uh, should be the numbers there, Sean. On the left, is there numbers there? Yes. Yeah, that's Adam and Eve. Very good. If God knew Adam and Eve were going to eat the fruit, then it's not Adam and Eve's fault for eating it. They had no other choice to obey God's plan. Should we really blame them for original sin, even if God knew it? And I know what you're going to say, they had a choice. No, they didn't have a choice. If you think God is omniscient and there is no free will... And there is no way around this problem. God's, God knows the next thought in our heads before we even think it. We do not have a choice if God is omniscient. It's a very difficult problem for um, Christians to overcome. God knew it all along. Most of us know that it's impossible to obey everything in the Bible, obey everything in the Bible in modern society. But I got a solution. What if God changed the Bible? Every Bible in the entire world, all at once, God could punch, expunge outdated verses and put in new ones. He could possibly make a different color for every hundred years. Now, that would be a supernatural act I could respect. If there was a perfect Christian God with perfect communication, why would he have 44,000 sects all believing different things? Is this the right design that a God would have if he was perfect? Why would God put the writing of his words in the hand of such fallible species as humans anyway. God could just create the Bible from nothing, poof, and have it magically appear in every country in the world and all the languages all at once. That would be awesome, but it didn't happen. When Christians pray and their prayers are heard by God, wouldn't God heal them in such a way that the evidence of Christians being healed more than other believers would be greater by percentage than any other religion. Yes, he would. But that doesn't happen. But we should see that happening in the Christian world because you pray that you're going to get well and it's just by chance that you get well. There have been dozens of prayer studies, many by Christian organizations, that result in no correlation between prayers and healing. Everyone on earth presented with the same medical condition and the same medical care lie, uh, li uh, lives and dies equally. That's a fact. There's no way around it. Lastly, if God is all-powerful, could he 
do something that he, his nature might not want him to do. If you call it nature, he's all-powerful. He could do anything. Could he commit suicide? Could he divide himself up into different gods? But there's no way to tell. Uh oh, I lost it. There's no way to tell exactly what his nature is based on the thousands of different Christian sects that believe in different interpretations. Maybe God could move to an adjoining universe and leave us all together, but if he did, how would we know? How would we know? Would we like. All the believers will say, I don't feel it anymore. No, probably they'd keep on believing. If the Christian God did exist and Christianity was the only true religion, hospitals would have a heyday on this. Oh, you're a Christian scientist. You're going to get healed 30% more than anybody else because Christian scientists, I guess, are the true religion or any other, pick any other sect. Christians would never have to leave their faith. Out of the 1,400 members that I have, half are believers, were believers. They were Bible studiers. They just didn't leave because they hated God. They didn't hate God. No biblical scholars were turned into atheists. There's dozens or hundreds of biblical scholars written lots of books, Bart Ehrman, uh, John Loftus, a lot of people that have, have, uh, read, have read the Bible and turned into atheists. The answers to the hardest questions would be so strong that there would be no question that Christianity was true. There would be no fallacies, no logical contradictions. Everything would be easily explained, and they would be, there would be very little to criticize. But that's not the case. Christianity, if true, would be so strong that an eighth grader could easily defend it against the smartest non-believer. And that's just not the case. If any religion was so true that all unabashed, educated atheists were joining that religion, I would seriously have to take a look, but that is not the case. In fact, atheism is growing now up to 20% of the U.S., 33% of kids, uh, people under 30. All the churches, half of the churches in Northern Europe are now nightclubs, bars, and restaurants. People are leaving the church. Why? Because of the internet expands knowledge. Religion, especially Christianity, can be extremely confusing on what sect is true. All of them have different demands on the Christian and different ways to get to heaven, faith, good, good works, whatever, they have all different doctrines and believe in things that other sects would consider only an apostate would do, speaking in tongues, not dancing, whatever. What would make Christianity the coolest religion? The coolest religion. God could send a prophet ever so often down to earth when Christians would be misinterpreting some of their text and would change the Bible verses so it would reflect more of the modern moral moralities. Eliminate slavery, for example, in the Bible. Or God himself could rearrange the text in all the Bibles, all at once. I think that's a double. I think I said that before. Would it be perfectly just God? Would a perfectly just God tell his parents to kill their son if he is insubordinate? No, of course not. Would this God kill 50,000 people? Almost. Okay, missing a slide there too? Okay. In a nearby village, just because a small group of Israelites who were returning the Ark to the Covenant to its rightful place, who looked at the Ark, 50,000 people, innocent, in a nearby village, gone, Two totally minutes. innocent. No, a righteous God would not do that. Would God endorse slavery? Could a perfect God commit, uh, make something perfect, could make something imperfect, like humans? No, if he was perfect, he couldn't. Would a just God punish humans indefinitely for finite sins? No. Uh, you're way ahead of us uh, there. Um, you're going to have to. Yes, that's okay. Are you on 58? Uh, you don't have numbers there, do you, Sean? Okay. Why did the scholars who were deciding on which books to be included in the Bible not include the books that were supposedly inspired by God as well? Why would a particular God want to destroy the world again during the apocalypse? and condemn good people all around the world, even those who have never heard of Christianity, that have good moral lives. One minute. One more time? One minute. One minute. Okay. By believing in an all... I'm just going to go straight to the conclusion, so you can ex the PowerPoint for me. By believing in an all-powerful deity paralyzes one thinking and cripples the choices you have to make to escape a false reality that is self-centered and apocalyptic. Looking at the truth requires courage and intellectual honesty of finding the best argument against your own. 
This is the holy grail of skepticism. If you're not willing to examine the arguments, then you have to admit that you're not willing to find the truth. No one can ignore billions of other people believing differently and justify that your God is the only one. If you question that, if you question what you believe, and more importantly, why you believe it, you just might extricate yourself from the supernatural world of belief and discover the wonder of naturalistic world without ghosts, demons, devils, magical thinking, or malicious God, gods. Live well in this world. It's the only one we know for sure that exists. At this Thank time, you. the other side will have 10 minutes to cross-examine. Me first? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. You ready to go? You going first? Timer ready? Yeah, I'll go All first. Right. Uh, Bruce, you're a naturalistic materialist, correct? Correct. Okay. Would you agree with Krauss and Sagan that uh, we're stardust? Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. Well, where do we come from? I don't believe God poofed us into existence, no. Now, for, as an atheist, you're, from your perspective, would you agree with Krauss and, and, and Sagan when they say human beings are stardust? We evolved naturally from material, yes. Okay. And so there's, uh, it's a godless universe, no governance, no guidance, matter I, in motion. I didn't say governance. Please guidance, try to speak no. into the microphone. No personal oh, governance, yeah. no personal governance and order. I could agree with that, personal, okay. sure. So given that naturalistic materialism, human beings being stardust, what's wrong with eating babies? <laughs> because we have a mind, we've evolved to have thoughts, and we care about other people, and we can Bruce, put Bruce, what's each wrong, other, morally wrong with each, eating babies? We can put ourselves in other shoes. That's why we don't kill babies. Okay, ready? We have evolved to accept morality. Over evolutionary time, Bruce, I'm going to ask you a question here. Over evolutionary time, you've had two values risen up over evolutionary time. You have stardust that likes to hurt people and inflict harm. And you have stardust over here that wants to do good and treat others well. Why are you arbitrarily choosing one value over the uh, other as stardust? That's an invalid question, Jeff. I'm not, that's an invalid question. It's, it's not an invalid question. There are not two different things going There's on. There's two the values level. risen up, Bruce. There are, there are not two values because at that particular time, no one was around to have values. No, Bruce, today, but, sure, there, there are two values risen up. One second. Uh, there are two values risen up. And so the question is, what's wrong with stardust bumping into stardust? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with stardust bumping into stardust. Could you stardust, allow Bruce but... to answer that question real oh, fast? Oh, sure. Uh, well, I, I might actually defer that question, but I don't see stars bumping into stars. What's your question, Jeff? No, stardust. You said human beings are essentially stardust. What's That's morally an equivocation wrong with stardust? argument, I think, that you're, you're saying we are stardust a lot more than stardust. Okay, Bruce, you still haven't answered the question. What's the wrong with eating do babies? Have the... The speakers I, I do have the option question, to defer Jeff. to their partners. What's wrong with it is that you, you actually support it because you read the Bible. This is, this is the insanity of belief, that you believe something that it's okay to do because God tells you to do it. Do you believe in, in killing Bruce, babies? Bruce, where in the Bible does God say to eat babies? That, eat the, babies? The reason, I, the reason I don't we, think it does. The reason it, it we doesn't. don't... To kill babies, yes, in okay. many, many verses. All right, go ahead. To, to skip a, a thousand reasons, there is one very simple reason why okay. we don't eat babies, and it's because we will no longer be. That would be the end of humanity if we all thought it was a good idea From to an eat atheistic babies. perspective, what's no, wrong no, no, with from, that? From, there is no atheistic perspective. You're assuming value and dignity in these human beings that you say we ought to protect. No, now, no, as a no, Christian, said, real fast, as a man, Christian, I can, I can justify that claim of human value and dignity in uh -huh. babies, but you're assuming it. I'm asking you to provide a justification no, as to why it's wrong to eat babies from an atheistic perspective. Okay. Give me so, a justification. Great. So three, three things. There is no atheistic perspective. Being an atheist Are you says, an atheist? Yes. There is no atheistic perspective. There's Are you giving me your perspective? The, I apologize. Every Wait. single time, I, like the middle of my sentence keeps interrupting the, the beginning Please, of Jeff, yours. Can you but, be considerate and let but, him answer? This is my time to ask questions. Yes, your time to you answer. You have to uh, uh, give the time to him okay. to okay. Uh, answer the question. Go ahead, please. I said nothing about values. I put it so simply as we do not eat babies because we would be no longer. 
If okay. we and what's wish... wrong with that from an atheistic perspective? That's what I've asked you a second okay. time now. So I'll, I'll answer it this time, yes? Okay. Okay, good. There's no atheistic, atheistic perspective. The fact that I do not believe one's claim that there is a supernatural God of any sort yes. does not guide my morals in any way. So, so your beliefs, your worldview does not guide your living My worldview, world. yes. The fact that I'm not convinced that any supernatural being exists has nothing to do with it. Okay, we've evolved in a purposeless, cosmic, cosmically purposeless universe. And now here we have babies. And you're suggesting that we should do good to these babies and not violate them and hurt them. Okay? Yes, yes. For, in, in a universe where there is no God, no ultimate standard of justice, I'm asking you to provide me an intelligible answer besides just preference, because I don't want to or we would die. I didn't, I didn't that, provi preference. that provides the preconditions necessary for intelligibility to make that claim mean something. Your claim is that there is no God, no ultimate purpose, meaning governance I in the I did not universe. claim there's no God. You, so you're saying, as, as an atheist, you accept God's existence now? No, I'm not convinced that one exists. That's okay. not a claim that he does so, not. So in a universe where we used to be fish, why is it wrong to violate a baby? And don't give me, and this is what I'm not looking you're, for, you're I'm, looking for, I'm looking for a justification. I'm looking for a justification, a justification that satisfies the preconditions of intelligibility. Not a mere claim, not what you think we should do, but what provides that justification. Do you want me to justify justification? intelligibility or do you want me to tell you why I don't eat babies? A, ju a justification from an atheistic perspective. Okay. okay. I have a question. He's, he just Go said ahead. there is no atheist perspective. Uh, let, me, let me chime in with a question here, if you don't mind. Um, I had read that, uh, Bruce, that you believe that uh, the idea of logic is really coming from the frontal lobe. Is that correct? Yes. And that you don't believe that people have souls, they have brains. Correct. I'm a, not a dualist. A dualist believes in a mind separate than the, than the brain. I believe that our mind is our brain. Right. And you obviously believe in the big, big, some sort of big bang. That's our best explanation right now, but I'm open to new explanations if something comes along. That's what skeptics do. So in light of that, let me ask you this question. You, you gave us some pretty horrible atrocities for us to consider on this screen. Do you think the people who did those things were wrong in doing those things? It doesn't matter if they think they were wrong or not. They did them justified by religious leaders at the time. I'm asking if you think those things that you showed that were so horrible, do you think they were wrong? Of course. Do you think those people should be held accountable for the wrong things that they do? Sure. Okay, so let me ask you this then. If we're just matter in motion, if we're just molecules... We are not matter in motion. If we're molecules flying through space... We're not if, molecules flying through space. If we're the end space. result of a big bang, because there was nothing, there was a big bang, and now we're sitting at the table. How can people be held accountable for their actions any more than a piece of shrapnel can be held accountable for landing where it lands when the explosion goes off? I'm wondering, how do you take that leap from being naturalistic to holding people accountable and stating that they are absolutely wrong say, for the things uh, they do? I'll just say one thing, that we live in a social contract. We live within a social contract. That's one of my answers. Okay. The shrapnel does not make decisions. We do. We realize that we are self-aware. The shrapnel is not. That's why we don't look at the shrapnel to ab abuse it afterwards. We look at the humans that made the decisions and, and fired the shot. Right, but if the, if the mind is and, and just mechanical, if it's just something that is material... Sure, and, and we don't need to I get mean, into... I mean, do you, do you see the, the difficulty... No, because no, no, I don't. Because okay. and, and I'll, I'll I think people would no, see yeah. the difficulty there, but maybe Let's, you don't. Right. And I think it's kind of obvious. Two minutes. Yes. the The reason that we do govern ourselves, that we do live in the social contract, that we to uh, to just avoid all of the obviousness that we are a social species, that we are tribal in nature. We we do come together. We protect each other. We want to live. We have a desire to sustain ourselves. Avoiding, like avoiding, all of, in, avoiding so all of the obvious. Short, if you don't mind, I'd like to get uh, my question in. Avoiding, avoiding all of the obvious along those lines. There are actual rational reasons. We can use empirical data to show that it is a bad idea to run around killing each other. Because if we all think that it's okay to just run around killing each other, okay. we no longer that's exist. That's sufficient. That's sufficient. I have one question for Bruce. In the closing statement of your debate, how do we know what is true? You said, I understand now through the process of looking at psychology on a very amateur level that we could be wrong big time on any of our thoughts, no matter what our personal experiences might be. 
Do you believe that you could be wrong about any of your thoughts? Of course As I do, said. but I have okay. a confidence level. Okay, that's, that's fine. That's that, fine. That, that is not mentioned in your in, in I have one last question. Debates. Could you be wrong about everything you said tonight? Say again? Could you be wrong about everything you said tonight? Logically I do not believe I am wrong. That's not my question. My confidence yes or no. level. You see, this is what the problem is, Sai. You deal with absolutes. Right. There, there's a range of confidence that people have. Are you saying there are no absolutes? <laughs> there is a range of, of confident Thank you. absolutes. There is another word game he's playing. I'm gonna, do I have any time, Christopher? 30 seconds, please. That? There is a confidence level that he completely ignores. He's gonna say, do you know that anything is true? And I'm gonna say, well, technically no. Confidence but I believe is... it's true because I have confidence that it's true. I have confidence that, that Sean's so not gonna So you have faith, Bruce? Have, Bruce, you have faith? It's confidence, Bruce, it's not you have, faith. Do you there's, have, okay. there's Bruce, five Bruce, different the, definitions time, of race. Can I, can I answer? Time, and I do not question. have faith. If you define I'm sorry, faith that's as a supernatural. time, gentlemen. I'll get that. Time. Uh, just so the audience sorry, understands, that, both sides in the debate requested and they were given a more conversational, open form of debate. So it feels like uh, they're talking over each other. A certain amount of that is allowed in this forum. Thank and at you. this time, we'll have direct arguments by Pastor Jeff Durbin. Hello. It is hot in here. Don't start the time yet. Don't start the time yet. Whew. Someone control the air in here? Yes, there is. She has the fan. Get her! No. Clock's ticking. All right. Thank you so much for the privilege of speaking with you tonight and the honor presented to us to be able to represent Jesus Christ and his gospel in the context of a debate which will assume things that only comport with his revelation to humanity and the biblical worldview. I would like to humbly point out the context of our debate. We are all debating while standing at the precipice of eternity. The subject of tonight's discussion, the existence and attributes of God, has a dramatic impact not only on our present circumstances and our ability to provide a meaningful foundation for all that we'll be appealing to this evening, absolute standards of ethics, necessary, unchanging, and universal laws of thought, the ethical responsibility to not choke each other to win tonight, or to lie, and a uniform creation where the principle of induction can be assumed. But we are, and whether, and, and whether or not we have peace with or reconciled with our God, who is the central reference point and foundation of all questions regarding truth and knowledge, he is the necessary precondition for our debate this evening. The great gift of tonight's debate is that both panels freely admit to representing a particular worldview. We're not pretending neutrality in this discussion, and neither are our opponents. We are unashamedly committed to Jesus Christ as God come in the flesh, the one who died for the sins of his people, conquered death, revealed himself in conscience, creation, and scripture, took on flesh, dwelled among us, and revealed himself to us, and apart from whom the, this debate wouldn't even be possible, nor have a coherent foundation. From a biblical and philosophical perspective, neutrality is a myth. From a biblical perspective, neutrality is a myth in the context of who we are. Romans chapter 1 says in verse 18 that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Think about what that's saying. It says, God's revelation to us is that all of us, not just Bruce and our atheist friends, but all of us before God are rebels against our Creator. And all of us are, because of sin, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. That's the context from a biblical perspective. Jesus says, you're either with me or against me. There's no neutrality with Jesus. From a philosophical perspective, all of us have a particular view of reality, and epistemology, how we can know what we know, and ethics, how we should live our lives. You've seen that just a moment ago. And before you this evening is a collision of worldviews. Each panel has professed beliefs about God, the world, origins, how knowledge is possible, the nature of human beings, human value and dignity, and our responsibilities to one another. Our opponents profess to reject the existence of their creator. They claim that we live in a non-personally guided and ungoverned cosmos, that our ancestors were fish, that we've evolved from highly evolved societies of bacteria, 
that we are stardust in a universe with no just divine justice ahead of any of us. We are fundamentally bipedal protoplasm with only sky above us. I want to encourage you to ju- not to judge God in his existence this evening. It's, futile, it's a futile pursuit to uh, question God's existence in his presence, by the way. But to judge the debaters, pay close attention to what each side is saying, what each side is supposed to be standing on. Because each side is standing on a particular worldview, I believe that it is important to ask the question, is what we are saying consistent with what we are standing on? Let me say that again, please, humbly. Is what we are saying consistent with what we are standing on? In other words, is what we are doing and what is coming out of our mouths consistent with the underlying worldview that we profess? In examining a particular person's worldview, it's important to watch for arbitrariness, mere personal opinions or unfounded prejudicial conjecture. For example, saying that we shouldn't eat babies because that would be the end of the human race. So what? (laughs) From an atheistic perspective, we're stardust. You're assuming what you have not proven. It's arbitrary. And watch for inconsistency. Is the person acting consistently with their platform or worldview that they say they're standing on? Is one side forced to abandon their platform or worldview in an attempt to borrow truths and concepts from the others that do not comport with their own professed view of the world? Let's start with the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview fundamentally says that God who declares the end from the beginning, who is the sovereign in the heavens above and on the earth below and does according to his will in the heavens above above and the earth below, that God, the eternal God, from eternity into eternity, the first, the last, that God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, just, and love has revealed himself in creation, conscience, and specifically in the person of his son. God has spoken. We have a revelational epistemology. We can know what we know because fundamentally God has talked to us. Bruce was wondering a moment ago about how can people be sure that that we know what's going on in his head. Well, the biblical claim is that God is all-powerful, all-knowing. He created all of us, including Bruce, and knows what he's thinking. A definition of God. Question four of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. This is for all of my, my Presby Brosifs. Reformed Baptists here. To show solidarity. Question four of the Westminster Confession. God is spirit, is a spirit infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Our argument this evening to our esteemed opponents is that the existence of the triune God and his attributes are the necessary precondition for intelligible experience. Apart from him, human value and dignity is an illusion. Laws of logic are not necessary and unchanging, and science is rendered useless apart from God. Our argument this evening is is that apart from the triune God revealed in the scriptures, you cannot provide a meaningful justification for claims to knowledge. You cannot prove anything, nor can you provide the preconditions necessary for all that we take for granted. The uniformity in nature, laws of logic and ethics. That is to say, we are arguing transcendentally. We are arguing, to quote Dr. Bonson, from the impossibility of the contrary. In my opening, I'd like to direct your attention to three specific points of contact to demonstrate that apart from the Christian God, you cannot know or prove anything. Number one, the uniformity in nature. From a biblical perspective, God is all-powerful. God is sovereign. He upholds all things by the word of his power, Hebrews chapter 1. Specifically, we have revelation from God, contact with God. The jailer has stepped down at a time, though we're chained to the wall, He has stepped down and touched us. He has told us that he carries the universe along to its intended destination. Christians have a meaningful warrant or justification to appeal to the principle of induction. Now, my friends, both atheists and Christian alike this evening, please pay close attention to this. Because everything that we're doing tonight, including what you're appealing to right now, depends upon this central point. The principle of induction in popular parlance, the uniformity in nature. That the future will be like the past. 
all inference, all science, all language is based upon fundamentally the uniformity in nature and that future experience will be congruent with past experience. And by the way, this is not a trick. Bertrand Russell, one of the most famous atheists in history, who wrote the book, Why I'm Not a Christian, also wrote a book in 1812 called, or 1912, I forget, sorry, um, Problems of Philosophy. He brought up the issue of induction in his book and demonstrated that you must provide a meaningful justification for the uniformity in nature, and you cannot appeal to past experience to do so. In other words, here's the question. In the uniformity in nature, how do our atheist friends who believe we live in a naturalistic, materialist universe provide a meaningful justification for science and logic that the future will be like the past, that the next five seconds will be like the past? And appealing to past experience, according to Bertrand Russell, one of the most famous atheists in history, is circular. It does not provide a meaningful justification. Christians can provide the preconditions for intelligibility as to why we can do science and how we can do science. Second point, laws of logic. Fundamentally, in the Christian worldview, we know that God is spirit. God is immaterial and unchanging. He is eternal. To engage in contradiction is to engage in the nature of lying. God, the scriptures say, cannot lie. To contradict yourself is to lie about what is true and about reality. Christians, listen closely, have a justification as to why we can appeal and how we can appeal to universal, unchanging, that's invariant, necessary laws of logic. We have the preconditions in the worldview that can make sense of that, and we have an answer for the moral requirement to be honest and have integrity when discussing proof or reason. Laws of logic, based in the very character of God, God cannot lie. God's thinking is consistent and rational. Our thinking is to be a reflection of his thinking. As his image, we are supposed to be like him. God is not the author of confusion. Number three, ethics. And this was assumed a moment ago. From a biblical worldview, we can have human value and dignity at the bottom of our system because all people, including atheists, are image of God and have value and meaning because they reflect the infinite value and goodness of the Creator. Human beings, all human beings, have value and dignity and worth by nature of being image of God. God has spoken. He says, love your neighbor. That is to say, as Christians, we actually have a basis to say we ought to, morally ought to, love our neighbor rather than eat our neighbor. From an atheistic perspective, standing on their worldview, they have no justification as to why we ought to love our neighbor rather than eat our neighbor. God is love. Love does no harm to its neighbor. We are image of God. Jesus says all the law and the prophets are based upon love for God, love for neighbor. Why do we not steal? We love our neighbor and we love God. Why do we not murder? Because we love God and love our neighbor. Love does no harm to its neighbor. We are image of God. The atheist claims the Bible is contradictory. Well, from an atheist perspective, so what? Our ancestors were fish. Religion is based on superstition. So what? Descendants of bacteria aren't obligated to worry about graduate school. Professed Christians have done evil things in history. From an atheistic perspective, so what? What African apes do to each other is morally irrelevant. There is evil and suffering in the world. So what? Richard Dawkins said, the universe as it exists displays there really is no good, no evil. There is only blind and pitiless indifference. Only blind and pitiless indifference. Dr. Will Provine, professor of biology at Cornell University, says that there is no imminent morality. Do you know what that means? It's an illusion. He says there's no human free will. We live, we die, and we're gone. We're absolutely gone when we die. That, my friends, is an honest atheist, although he doesn't have to be. 
Because from an atheistic perspective, there is no foundation to provide the necessary preconditions for integrity in debate. Atheists claim the Bible is full of evil. Well, brothers and sisters, friends, tonight, are you ready? So what? So what? Nothing is ultimately evil in an atheistic worldview. We're just doing what stardust does in a godless universe under these conditions. I want you to please to tonight ask the question over and over and over to each side, both the Christians and the atheists. I want you to ask this very simple question. Are you ready? So what? When claims are made, if so what is a philosophically devastating critique of your worldview, it is not a worldview you should hold on to any longer. In honor of Dr. Bonson, he said in his debate with Edward Tabash, the atheist is satisfied to ignore the need for intellectual justification and explanation, the need to gain consistency within his total beliefs, and the need to demonstrate systematic cogency in his overall perspective on the world, man, and values. In this light, atheism, for all its proud boast of scholarly adequacy, is a kind of intellectual adolescence which refuses to think hard, face the facts, and be tough-minded. Atheists live when all is said and done by blind and contradictory faith about how we know what we know and what the nature of reality is. Atheism is arbitrary and irrational, all the while dressing up in the costume of rationality. Atheism, philosophically speaking, is much closer to superstition, undisciplined reflection, and wishful thinking than to science. That was my shout out to Bonson. <laughs> Three things I want to humbly present to you tonight. The claim is not, listen closely, the claim tonight is not that atheists don't do science, don't appeal to logic, and don't have an ethical system. The claim is that they cannot account or justify any of those things. Saying something doesn't justify it. You must provide the preconditions necessary to make that claim intelligible. If you're going to claim science, you have to be able to justify meaningfully how that is possible in a godless universe. If we live in a universe that is not governed by God and is ultimately without cosmic purpose, it is devolved down to time and chance acting on matter. And you do not have a justification or an answer for David Hume, the Scottish skeptic on induction, nor for Bertrand Russell, saying, well, it always has been in the past, is, philosophically speaking, adolescent. Number two, our challenge is that God is the necessary precondition to make sense of human experience, that apart from him, you cannot prove anything and that we can prove God from the existence of the contrary. I want you to think tonight, if you would, with me. This, this is for Christians and for atheists. I love, by the way, as atheists, you're my favorite. But I'd like you to do this tonight. Would you test our claims? We have already professed before you that we are standing on a particular view of the world. To come here tonight and to give us a perspective of the world and then claim that that's in fact not a perspective of the world is not helpful in a debate. I'd like you, if you would, to imagine for a moment that we are standing on two stages. And underneath us is what we profess to believe about the world. Now, if you would tonight, I'd like you to look at two what comes out of minutes. our mouths. I want you to think about what comes out of our mouths and ask this question. Besides, so what? I'd like you to ask the question, is what's coming out of their mouth consistent with what they say about the world? And the third thing I'd like you to know tonight is that there is hope in Jesus Christ. Listen, this is not a mere intellectual game. This is the stuff of life. This is whether or not we have a meaningful foundation to tell people that science is an important enterprise, that science is necessary, that laws of logic are universal and unchanging and they are necessary. This is about the stuff of life. This is about meaningful human experience. 
This is not merely an intellectual game or gymnastics. And in the end, this is very much about what life is all about. God is who he says he is, and he is a necessary precondition for this entire debate tonight. I would say our atheist friends have violated their own professed beliefs about the world by showing up. Because if atheism were true, we wouldn't have any meaningful justification for all that we're appealing to tonight. Uniformity in nature, laws of logic, and absolute standards of ethics. But in the end, here's what's most important. God became a man in the person of Christ, lived a righteous and sinless life, died for sinners, and rose from the dead. Not merely to save you for heaven one day, but to save all of you now. To reconcile you to himself now. And he doesn't just reconcile you to himself and bring you to peace through the cross. He also saves your mind. At this time, the atheist will have 10 minutes to cross-examine. Remember that any of the three respondents can respond to a question. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I'd like to start off with just a few questions of clarification. Um, right. Please speak right into the microphone. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. Uh, just a few questions of clarification. Um, is there any experience or set of experiences that could possibly change your mind about the nature of God? Um, any, I say that again. Is there any experience or set of experiences that could possibly change your mind about the nature of God? Sure. If, if God had revealed himself in his word as different than I believe, then I would be diff believe differently. But we believe as Christians that God is the very necessary precondition. Well, going forward, you've already been revealed yeah. those things, right? Yeah. So going forward from that point, uh, wouldn't you have to go in the past to, to make that change you suggested? Yeah, I'm not understanding your question. Maybe you could say it again. Okay, so this is an experience that would happen to you now or in the future. So a theoretical experience yes. of, say, if you can explain, I'm, I'm confused about what you're asking. Mm -hmm. So is there any theoretical experience that could change your mind? Sure, if God revealed differently than he already has, I would, I would believe God. In other words, if I had beliefs about God that, that were in fact like? not true, and I had seen in God's word that this is actually what God says, I'd be corrected by that. What would that revelation look like? Well, Scripture. God has spoken but scripture supremely is, in His Scripture son. has been scripted already. Yeah, so God has spoken in... So it would require Hebrews. a new Scripture? Well, Hebrews chapter 1 actually says, in answer to your question, if I go to what God has actually said, Hebrews 1 says that God has in the past spoke to the fathers through the prophets, and these last days has spoken to us through His Son. And so we have the supreme revelation of God in His Son, and we have that revelation recorded for us in Scripture. And so what I go to for certainty is what God has revealed. Okay. Well, I'm really glad to hear this um, because this is a really strong point of common ground for us to say that uh, we both are willing to take in new experiences and adjust our world worldview accordingly. And so uh, this... Uh, well, I, this I may just make, stand a correction there. That's, that's not actually what I said, not just merely take in experiences and adjust our worldview. You have subjective experiences as an atheist that you have to appeal to, and you have brain gas happening, right? And brain gas? Biochem that's, that's, biochemical that's, responses. Is that Mountain Dew gas or Dr. No, Pepper bi gas? Biochemical responses are firing in your brain. And so based on those experiences, you live and move in the world. Um, and so when you have experiences, it's based upon personal preference and examination and some, you know, your senses. But as a Christian, we surround an objective revelation. God has spoken, okay, and so that's the standard. I see. Uh, would the two of you uh, concur that... Uh... I think I could maybe help clarify. I think there are peripherals of our faith that we could be wrong, but that does therefore not follow that there are things that we cannot be certain about. And I would say those attributes of God that we can and are certain about are the same ones that you are certain about. Okay, those that God is love, a, that God I, is good. And so I would say, no, I cannot be wrong about those. Let me, my answer, I, I, I think there's a equivocation on your question. If you're asking um, if my understanding of Scripture is itself canon, I would say, no, my understanding isn't canon. I'm not assigning canonicity to myself. I err in my understanding of Scripture. But I think if what you're asking is, can I be corrected in my understanding of Scripture, um, the answer would be yes. Okay, so your knowledge uh, that comes from the Bible is provisional because it's subject to interpretation. Right. Great. Um, can you clarify real quick, what are your basic assumptions? What are your most basal assumptions for your worldview? 
Well, you, they have to ask you first. God well, is, yeah, sure. Okay, so um, God is. He is eternal. He is holy. He is unchanging. I gave you a definition in the opening statement. If you're asking once again to clarify... So the Christian God is your basal assumption? It's yeah. uh, that God exists and his word is true. Okay. All right, uh, so... I would not use the term basal assumption. That's more of an atheistic term. I would say that God has revealed himself certainly <laughs> such that we are certain of his existence. Are, are you saying that your worldview is, uh, is anti-foundational, that you do not have a basal assumption? No, uh, but I'm, the thing is, assumption is, is something that's just arbitrarily done. It's not what the Christian has. We don't just simply assume because it helps us in our life. We're saying that we have a certain foundation by which we can know things to be true. Your position and, is called presuppositionalism. That's you right. must presuppose or assume God right. in order to get to your destination. Yeah, but that's not something that we do autonomously. That's something that God reveals to us. He makes us know. Okay, so that's not, the, that's not the starting point then, it sounds like. Our starting point is God's revelation, his own revelation. It is for you too, by okay, the way. Okay, so it's not the existence of God, it's God's revelation. So it sounds like you're starting with the Bible. Well, we're starting or with God's... internal knowledge. Well, I'm saying that even if a person has never seen a man with a Bible, he still has that presupposition of God. Otherwise, you couldn't make sense of the reason. You couldn't make sense of the question you're asking us. Okay, so it sounds Maybe I can like... Help. John Calvin, in his first chapter, The Institute of the Christian Religion, addresses this issue of knowledge of God and knowledge of self. And both of them basically are simultaneously. You can't have knowledge of self without knowledge of God, and you can't have knowledge of God without knowledge of self. So that is the basic makeup of our epistemology. I think that's just a claim. There's no justification behind that. But you could be wrong about everything, it's, Bruce. It's, Don't forget. It's actually, it's actually my answer. So how, could you. How did, how did God reveal himself to you? That's actually irrelevant. Because I don't know how God made a cow, but I know for certain that God made a cow. God well, reveals himself many relevant. ways. Well, Jeff, Jeff well, said, sure, said I'll give you the answer that. God, okay, God has revealed Thanks. himself in conscience. God has revealed himself in revealing his law to his creatures. God has revealed himself in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. So you're honor. just saying everything that you see and experience is no. God revealing himself to you? No, 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 I didn't say that. It was actually God has revealed himself according to Romans 1. He's made himself known to all of us. There's a... Senses to divinitanus. There's a, a sense of the divine and unavoidable, the inescapable sense of God. There is creation itself testifying to us about God. There's mm -hmm. also God Himself stepping into creation and walking among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So there are there are various ways God has revealed Himself uh, to us. And I think one to be to be clear, you you read Romans, you saw life on this planet, and you therefore knew that God existed. No, there's, there's. I think I, I, I think I laid out a little more than that. There's more. Which, than I'm just trying those. to. Yeah. yeah. I think and to answer same, your question, same, yeah. uh, uh, I think the, the the term that most people in this room would mm -hmm. understand is the term self-evident. Right. That the existence of God is self-evident. This you, might be helpful to you. This might be helpful go to ahead. you. If you want to know how I'm certain that God exists, uh -huh. the same way you are. Okay. Well, obviously, I'm I'm not. Well, well, the thing is, when you're in your, your quiet moment, when you have your head on your pillow, you want to know how I'm certain? Think about how you're certain that God exists. I, I know that for this okay. debate, we have to you know, uh, put our position forward. Size, size. I'm, I'm asking that. you questions so that you can give me your perspective. That's Do fair. me a favor, don't tell me mine, because well, well, that, be, that would not make any sense. I mean, I, I don't need to be fair. here if, but, but his if well, you just want to... His perspective is that he knows your perspective. Yeah. Yes, okay, good. So you know my mind. Can I... Can I... I know what God says about your mind. So God told you about my mind. Right. Okay. Yes. Are you certain? Yes. How did he tell you these things? Through his word. What did he say to you? He said that you are without excuse for your suppression of the truth. Uh-huh. And how do you know that I... Because uh, you're basically calling me a liar right now. No, what I'm saying that is you're I'm a truth suppressor. It's truth a culpable suppressor. suppression can of I, the truth. I, can I, this is important, too. Two when minutes, the, when we gentlemen. say from God's, from God's word, he tells us, all of us, not just you guys, all of us before uh -huh. Christ and reconciliation with God, all of us suppress the truth of God. We construct a very uh, sophisticated worldviews and religions to, uh, to, to, to remove God from our mm -hmm. knowledge. It's not just you, but it's a sinful suppression of truth. Right. And, and so that's why, that's why that suppression takes place. We're not saying that you are necessarily constantly aware of it and you're got running it. out of this room here and I you're going, ha ha, we got those yes, guys, yeah. you know, we're suppressing the truth and the righteousness. Uh, Being, we're not okay. saying that takes no, no, place. No, I, I got you. We're, uh, saying, that, we're saying you're self in this last question here. Because sin corrupts our reasoning faculties. Okay, got it. So you, you are aware that there are people around the world and throughout history that believe in other gods and multiple gods and very, very different types of gods 
Hold on. Idolatry is popular. And there are people in this world that have no concept of God, that where their language, there is no God in their language. They have zero concept of God. And these same and, people And there are people the like me, which despite what you assert, I do not and have not at any point in my life I've never been a believer in God. Can I, I've can never I, been. Can I respond? I've never. I haven't asked a question. Well, I've never been. I've never been running. convinced. I know it is. Okay. That's why I Supposed cut you off. Questions. Yeah, asking now, questions. Now, there are other people just like me that do not believe in God. So, uh, please avoid just asserting that we're all lying or suppressing the question? truth or delusion. Stop question? asserting your world. The, okay. Can I? The, can I? Can I respond? The question. You're, the question is, okay. how do you know? How was it revealed to you? with certainty, with absolute certainty, that the Christian God does exist. Because apart from God, you couldn't frame the question. That's, because gonna, he's I'm a gonna, necessary gonna, precondition for all that you're assuming. Jeff, you said, one, one you thing said in, fast, your, in your you opening statement. You ran for a minute asking a question, yep. if I can have a few volume. seconds to answer. You're evidencing dependence upon him right now mm -hmm. because though you claim to be an atheist, you assume things that do not comport with atheism. For instance, you're here arguing about absolute laws of logic and contradictions. You're trying to get to standards of truth that exist outside of yourself. You're assuming induction this entire time you've been sitting here. You've not thought you're going to float away to the ceiling at any point. You're okay. assuming long, ethical no, uh, absolute Jeff. values. Jeff, in your, your opening statement, your opening statement, Jeff, time. you said saying something time. doesn't time, sir. doesn't mean it. Absolutely. At this time, Cy Tenbruggen Kate. Oh. will begin his rebuttal arguments for 15 minutes, followed by five minutes of cross-examination. Yeah. Wow, the Bonson Conference. Cool. First one was a couple years ago in 2013, and I looked at the list of speakers, and I thought, there is no way I'm ever going to speak at the Bonson Conference. <laughs> If you look at your list of speakers, you see I was half right, but I do get to come out to this debate here today. And I'm very thankful for this church for putting it on. And I just found out today that one of my main mentors in this apologetic, he messaged me on Facebook that he was introduced to presuppositional apologetics by your pastor, Paul Vigiano. So. And of course, I've been a, a, a devotee of Bont, and I'm going to take my time for this because I don't have a lot to say in uh, rebuttal. But uh, about eight years ago, I um, was on an operating table and I had to have my appendix removed. And there were complications. And after that, a few days later, they actually had to zap my heart to correct a rhythm in it. And I got home from the hospital. I got an email from my pastor. And he didn't say, oh, I'm glad you're home. I hope you're doing all right. The only thing he said, aren't you taking your adulation for Bonson a little bit too far? <laughs> That's the kind of family that I have. And I have to tell you that before this debate, I do have a bit of a heart condition. So it was racing. So for those Christians in here, please pray for me that doesn't uh, rear its head. Um, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I'm just going to, it'll help me maybe even be a little bit uh, calmer than you might have seen me in the past. But I do want to um, start my rebuttal by saying that Jesus Christ is king. Jesus Christ is king. He's my king. He's your king. He's their king. See, the difference between the camps tonight is not the kingship of Jesus Christ. The difference between the camps is that we profess it and they suppress it. You see, according to our worldview, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He's the creator of all things and nothing is possible without him. Not even this debate here tonight. See, I thank Jesus Christ for allowing this debate to take place in a place of worship, no less. A place where tonight our God is being blasphemed. And he allows that to take place. See, because blasphemy against God is not only taking his name in vain, it's taking his word in vain. And the word of God says that everyone knows that he exists and they're without excuse for their sin against him. Now, our atheist opponents want me to not say that. They want me to give up my worldview. That's what my worldview says. I will not depart from it. I refuse Will they depart from their worldview? Will I say, don't use logic because that's a foundational part of you? No, they won't allow that. So, becoming a Christian is not a matter of going from unbelief in God to belief in God. It's going from suppressing the truth to professing it. Our, our opponents tonight are suppressing the truth about the God that they know exists, that everyone knows exists. 
Not a sufficient knowledge for their salvation, but a sufficient knowledge for their condemnation. You see, it's one thing to make that claim. It's another to prove it. Well, as Christians, we have sufficient proof in the Word of God. But tonight, I'm going to further evidence that claim. See, according to Romans 11.36, from God, through God, and to God are all things. What do all things include? Truth, logic, reason, science, morality, all things. Our opponents here tonight have attempted to use all of them, but have neglected, neglected to justify their ability to do so without God. Pay close attention, because they won't. They'll give you arbitrary answers, but they will not give you the justification for the complaints about the God that created them, the God that has given them every breath, the God that has allowed them to be here tonight, the God that has allowed them to blaspheme his name tonight. See, in the closing statement, I referenced that in my question to Bruce of a debate that he did recently, how do we know what is true? Bruce said, I understand now through the process of looking at psychology on a very amateur level that we could be wrong big time on any of our thoughts, no matter what our personal experiences might be. We could be wrong about everything. So I asked him, was that, yes, he believes that. He could be wrong about everything. Now, what's what you said. I did not expect this debate to be any different from all the other debates I've had. But after I saw that from Bruce, I thought, what's the point? In a debate about truth, he says he could be wrong about everything. He says we could be wrong about everything. When he says that, he gives up knowledge. He can therefore know nothing. Now, why is that the case? See, because if you asked me the speed of the road outside this church, and I said to you, it's 30 miles per hour, but I could be wrong. Do I know it? Not if I could be wrong. I might believe, I could even be right, but I don't know it if I could be wrong. He's admitted that, we could, that he could be wrong about everything he claims to know. And he wants to stand here and make knowledge claims. There's one in particular. He says, one in particular here, he says, that's a fact, there is no way around it. Does that sound like somebody who could be wrong about everything he claims to know? He's borrowing from the God he knows exists. See, we've come here to debate truth, and our opponent has given up truth. As I said in that debate, he says he could be wrong big time on every one of his thoughts. But wait, that's not what he said. He said we could be wrong about every one of our thoughts. Well, there's a problem with that. You see, if he could be wrong about any of his thoughts, how could he know what we could be wrong about? Because he could be wrong about that. And that's the absurdity of atheism. See, it's worse than that. If Bruce could be wrong about any of his thoughts, guess what? He could be wrong about his thought that we could be wrong about any of our thoughts. You might have to play that back. But... <laughs> that's quite simply absurd. You see, when I go out evangelizing, I present people with an option. Jesus Christ or absurdity. I cannot make anyone choose either. Very often, though, people choose absurdity. Why? Because they love their sin. You see, Bruce will say that we could be wrong about any of our thoughts, and then we'll come to a debate and argue as though he's right about his thoughts, and we're wrong about ours. See, in the newspaper article concerning this debate, Bruce is quoted as saying that presuppositional apologetics is absurd. Really? Absurd? Well, could he be wrong about that? Yes. That's an absolute statement. And you see, when I asked him about an absolute statement, he shied away from it. He got away from it. He doesn't want to go down that road because it is absurd to reject absolutes absolutely. You see, not only has Bruce given up all knowledge, he wants to hold us to a standard of rationality which he must borrow from the Christian worldview. What is something that's absurd? Well, something that deviates from an absolute standard of rationality. Where does Bruce get that without God? Here's another claim that he made. Atheism is a better worldview to live by. A better worldview? As an atheist, shouldn't he just say it's a different worldview? When you say one worldview is better than another, you're comparing it to an absolute standard. Where does he get that without God? Borrowing from our worldview. Sean Taylor is quoted in that same article as saying that belief in God is illogical. What does that assume? that there's an absolute standard of logic 
that our belief deviates from? Where do they get that absolute standard without God? You see, Jeff touched on it a little bit earlier, but logic is universal. Logic is not made of matter, and logic does not change. God is universal. God is not made of matter. God does not change. I'm not saying that God is logic, but God is logical. And we have a worldview that makes sense of logic. Ask the atheist, where do you get universal, abstract, invariant laws from without God? They will not give you an answer. They'll dance, but they will not give you an answer. Now, this debate is titled The Existence and Attributes of God. Well, I just shared you with you one of his attributes. God is logical. Our opponents have accused us of being illogical. Well, as my brother Jeff so wonderfully articulated in his opening statement, so what? What's wrong with being illogical to advance bags of primordial goo? You see, I can tell you why it's wrong to be illogical. Because we're created in the image of God. Ephesians 5 verse 1, we're told to be imitators of God. When you are illogical, you're saying that God is illogical. See, a logical contradiction amounts to a lie. When you're saying it's both the case that my car can be in the parking lot and not in the parking lot at the same time in the same way, you're lying. God tells us not to lie. Why can you not have logical contradictions in a worldview without God? Where do you get laws that forbid contradictions in a worldview without God? My friends, it's absurd. They will not answer those questions. I mean, they will try and get away from them, they'll try and get around them, but they won't answer that question. Here's another attribute of God. God is not a thief. Why is stealing wrong? Not because it makes people mad, not because of, you know, whatever reason that they're going to come up with, an arbitrary reason. Stealing is wrong because God is not a thief. You're created in his image. When you steal, you call God a thief. That's why stealing is absolutely morally wrong. I can answer that question. Why is adultery wrong? They might even disagree with that point. But adultery is not wrong because it destroys families, which it does. It's a terrible consequence. It's not wrong because it destroys marriages. It's a terrible consequence. That's not why it's wrong. Why is adultery absolutely morally wrong? Because God is perfectly faithful. When you're committing, ma'am, do you mind? This is not a participatory uh, thing with the audience. Why is adultery wrong? Because God is perfectly faithful. That's why it's wrong. And when we commit adultery, we call God an adulterer. That's why it's wrong. Now, people are uncomfortable with stuff like that because it holds a mirror up to their life. It's not wrong because of some arbitrary command of God. It's wrong because of who God is. And everyone here knows that. That's why they know things are wrong, ma'am. That's why you know things are wrong when you do them. And you suppress that truth. And the older you get, the more you're going to suppress that. God's going to hand you over to it. That's why you need to repent tonight. Because God hands people over to the suppression of the truth. You see, I go to college campuses and I talk to young kids and I can talk with them. I can have a nice philosophical argument with them. I could tell them. But when they get older, I go to the Reason Rally and the people in their 40s and 50s, they give me the finger. And I'm their best friend. See, if somebody's walking towards a cliff, who's the best friend? Not the one who talks about how nice a day it is, nice, what you're wearing. It's the one who says, stop, there's a cliff. Amen. And my friends, there's a cliff that these people are walking towards. That's why we're here. You see, according to their worldview, our thoughts are nothing more than brain barf, chemical reactions, and they want to hold us to a standard that they simply can't justify without God. No. Bruce doesn't have faith. He doesn't have faith. He has confidence. Confidence. Confide. From the Latin, with faith. But this man's faith is going to lead him to hell. And we have to love on them tonight. Love on them. Love on them. Love on your atheist friends. Two minutes. Tell them about the God that they know exists. That's why I'm a presuppositionalist. Because I'm not here to coddle people into hell with evidences. No. I'm here to hold the mirror up and show them the God that they know exists. You see, when you give truth to people, it doesn't matter if they mock you. It doesn't matter if they tell you not to talk like that anymore. Who are they coming to when they're in trouble? When they have trouble in their life, they're not coming to the person who's argued with them about the complexity of the eye for six hours. They're coming to the person who said, I know that you know. Our Bible says they know. They know. Are they lying? No. They're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. They lift up other beliefs and they suppress the other ones. Why? Because they love their sin just like you and I did. 
that God saved us from that. It's nice to be in a crowd where the majority is Christians for a change, and I love your faces, I love your nod, nodding of your heads. Pray for them. Pray for them. Right now, it's not too late. Amen. At this time, the other side will have five minutes for cross-examination. Two quick questions for Sai. First of all, you said it's absurd to be, pre to be absolutely, uh, to, to present absolute, absolutely, correct? I, I, sorry, I didn't even understand that question. You said that it is absurd to present absolutes absolutely. No, it's, it's absurd to deny them. Absolutely. That's what you said. You said, it's, I wrote it down. It is absurd to present absolutes absolutely. Well, I believe exactly that, what you said. I believe that if I did, I misspoke. What I meant to say was it's absurd to deny absolutes absolutely. I could have misspoken. I don't okay. think I did, but we'll see. Do you, you think I believe in God? No, I don't think you believe in God. I know you do. Okay. <laughs> believe and know are two different things. But uh, That's correct. I'm going to ask you a question. Short story. I got in an accident on the I-5. I rolled over my truck five times in the middle of nowhere. 2 a.m., I was rolling over, the, the, the roof was collapsing on my head. I knew that I could die. I knew this could be it. Five times. Do you think I would think about God during that time? Don't know, don't care. You don't know and you don't care? No. Why don't you It's care? irrelevant to the topic of this debate. I'm asking you, this, this is Q&A, this is kind of informal Q&A. Okay, If I on. did that, I wouldn't be answering any of your questions because they don't have no, anything no, to do with the debate. No, no, I'm, I'm telling you my honest answer. I don't know whether you did in an accident five years ago. I'd care about your soul tonight. Oh, you said you don't care. Right. Now you do care. I don't care about five years ago when you had your accident. I care about you tonight. Tonight. I'm talking to a flesh and blood person creating the image of God. I care about you tonight. I, well, for the record, I did not think of any God at that particular time. I okay, thinking, therefore God does not exist. I was thinking exist. that the people who were, were making my truck, constructing my truck in Detroit somewhere, knew it good. I'm going to... Is it therefore true? Well, you asked the question. <laughs> Sean, you have a question? Uh, I have a question. Um, so, there's a lot on this, uh, on this issue of um, the requirements for the, for the uh, conditions of uh, intelligibility. But... Um, there's a few, uh, few biblical quotes I'd like to run by you. Uh, Romans 12, verse 2, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Proverbs 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. Or sorry, do not lean on your own understanding. Um, aren't these statements a bit self-defeating? We're supposed to utilize our understanding to read these passages that tell us not to utilize our understanding. You, what's the question? No, no, I, I have an answer for you, and then Jeff can answer. My answer, pizza sleeps fast under the west, therefore the much. You're missing the point? Excuse me? You're missing the point? What was wrong with my answer? It, uh, it misses the point, is what is wrong with it. So these are verses that say, don't use your reason. How do well, you well, he can answer. Can I? I'm, well, okay, I, you know, the, the thing is, what I did there is I answered very illogically, and he didn't accept it. Why not? Because he appeals to an absolute standard. That's what I was doing, but go ahead, Jeff. Oh, if, you go ahead. If, um, let me just see if I can clarify, because I think you're, you're and maybe it's just um, you haven't studied exegesis or uh, Bible exposition. Possibly. But when I tell my son, and I give my son advice, and he argues with me, I, don't, I want him to use his understanding to understand what I'm saying. So when I say to my son, lean not on your own understanding, but trust me, I'm not telling him to not think. I'm telling him to take the counsel of somebody who knows better than he. Paul's a lot nicer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant, that's my answer. <laughs> I just translated into modern logic. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little confused at this point. Um, there's Welcome to the club. Yeah, I've had a number of things. One um, minute. But hey, I can't well, be you, certain about it. Well, evolved pond um, scum can expect confusion. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Jeff, again, started off tonight with saying, saying something doesn't justify it. Yes, right. 
Um, Making a claim doesn't just just it doesn't justify it. You have to provide a meaningful warrant. That's right. Um, and there, there's been a lot of discussion about the infinite regress. You know, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? You got to get down to a, a foundation. Everyone has presuppositions, assumptions, whichever you, way you want to call it, at the bottom of their epistemology, their their worldview, how they how they think and and come to knowledge. I haven't seen the justification, though. I, I've I've heard insults and, and assertions that that we are just suppressing God. We know it, you know, everyone knows it, which would work well for your position, except for I really don't, and I'm really not, okay? I'm very open to it. You don't mind I'm that not, we trust please, God's please. word over yours? It's unbelievable. The middle of my sentences continue <laughs> to interrupt the beginning of yours. Well, here's is the thing. Absolutely <laughs> wrong? Well, can I say it's time, thing gentlemen? Be helpful is if instead of, instead it's time, of gentlemen. comments for Time, gentlemen. Questions. I believe it's Sean Taylor. At this time, you have 15 minutes for... Uh, no, actually, uh, it's me. I'm up. Andrew Breeding, 15 minutes. Thank you, everybody, for having us here tonight. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I want to take a second to thank uh, everyone for having us come uh, and for coming out yourselves. I know it's not an easy thing to uh, consider the arguments and reasons, thank you, the arguments and reasons uh, for beliefs that are closely held and dearly held, uh, but all of you had my admiration for coming tonight. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that this is indeed a debate. It is a debate that has ensued for millennia and continues to across the world even as we speak. Theists become atheists, atheists become theists, Christians become Hindus, Muslims become Jews, Buddhists become Jedi, now you're thinking, I want to Brutus, maybe, huh? No, no. People are, people are arguing for all sorts of positions, and moreover, people are changing their minds all the time. As they should be. This is not a clear-cut issue. It is, in fact, a very open question. This is what makes presuppositionalism as a platform so attractive. It stares into the face of this reality and says, no, it is not an open question. Yes, it is a clear-cut issue. Let me explain. For thousands of years, belief in God has been a matter of faith. There may be pieces of evidence for the existence of God, but never so much that we could prove it, hence taking the leap of faith the rest of the way. Then some interesting theologians arrived on the scene and said, maybe, without God, we could never even grasp reason. They went further and said, no, it's more than maybe. There's no other way it could be. Some Christian theologians then still went further and said, in fact, the Christian God is the only God that could do this. However, I regret to inform you that despite this argument's popularity among the Presbyterian Orthodoxy, God is not required for humans to be able to grasp reason. Don't get me wrong, it's entirely possible that God is responsible for our ability to reason. But it isn't necessary, as our debaters suggest. But even if God was the architect of our intellectual capacities, there's no reason to think that the Christian God, specifically, is the only one that could give us this. We intend to demonstrate this on two primary fronts. The first is that the presuppositional understanding of logic rigidly ignores many of the alternative accounts for its nature. These accounts offer us completely rational explanations of logic without the need of positing such features as immateriality or absoluteness. These features, as you will come to see, as you may have already seen, are critical to the successful argumentation of presuppositionalism. The second front is that there are numerous, perhaps even an infinite number of gods which could account for the existence of our world, including the satisfactions, uh, including the satisfaction for the preconditions of knowledge. So let's get into the arguments then. So first of all, we've heard Pascal's wager come already into account tonight. Uh, you know, we gotta, we got to get people turned around so they don't go to hell, so that they do go to heaven. But in the face of hundreds of God beliefs that are held today, which could be extended to an uncountable number of possible gods, the probabilistic calculus of Pascal's wager breaks down. With an infinite number of gods, you divide by infinity, you get zero. That's set theory. Or even with two gods, one, both who give infinite punishment and infinite uh, reward, 
you can't make a make, can't make a choice there if it's a, if it's a equitable situation. Another argument is just a simple common sense argument. Uh, Sai and the, and the rest of these guys claim that everyone believes in God. No, they know that everyone believes in God. But I honestly don't. I've studied this issue and thought about it for years. Uh, I'm open-minded to it. I really am. But I don't. So they must be wrong about at least this particular point. Another argument. Logical absolutes do not require God to exist, as our debaters suggest. It is completely possible that logic exists on its own, just in the way that God exists on his own. Nothing suggests that logic would somehow implode or degrade without God sustaining it. Presuppositionalists assume the existence of God. An assumption, by definition, is a proposition without positive proof, without being known. This initial step is the downfall of claiming knowledge to God. If you assume in God's existence, you can't know it. It is an assumption. It's taken without proof. It is not known. A question that's come up multiple times is, uh, how could we have acquired logic and reason without God? But we could have acquired it through a process of change and development. After all, we look at the range of life on Earth and we see creatures in all different stages of developed reason, from none to learning, social rule following, tool usage, and unique problem solving. One of the most interesting examples is that crows can, without training, use various tools in a correct sequence to collect food. Their ability to formulate a solution to a novel problem seems to demonstrate a simple form of reasoning. Logical absolutes also may, in fact, not be absolute. They, like some scientific laws, may just be true in certain circumstances. This is why there are so many different kinds of logical systems. There's Aristotelian logics, Boolean logics, fuzzy logics, symbolic, propositional, predicate, computability, intuitionalist, linear, modal, paraconsistent, non-monotonic. These logical systems are often not compatible with each other. Hence, the necessity of using them to do different kinds of work in different areas of life. It's not only within logic itself that the lack of absolutism is apparent. There are observations in the world, and accordingly, there are scientific laws which appear to violate one or more of the classical laws of logic. For example, the wave mechanical, sorry, the wave mechanical uh, model of atomic orbitals tells us that electrons can simultaneously be and not be at any point around an electron cloud. Now, if you're like me, the first time you heard this, it sounded like gibberish, but basically, around an atom, you have an electron going around, and you can take a snapshot at any point in time, and you can't predict where that, where that uh, is gonna be. It's simultaneously nowhere and everywhere at once, and this violates two, at least one, possibly two, of the laws of logic. Uh, nextly, logic does not necessarily exist. I know this sounds a little bit silly, but does Sherlock Holmes exist? No, he's a fictional character. Similarly, logic can be a useful fictional device, sometimes referred to as a convention. Conventions are formed thanks to their public utility, like driving on the right side of the road or covering your mouth when you cough. You wouldn't say these things are transcendent or immaterial or unchanging. No, they're just conventions that we practice that came about over time. Another argument uh, you heard me mention here uh, a little bit earlier, the Bible has to be interpreted. And uh, as a result, our knowledge acquired through the, the Bible is provisional. It is open to change because we can be wrong about our interpretations. This is not a bad thing, but it does mean that the knowledge we acquire from the Bible, we have to, we have to accept that it, it can't, it, it's not a 100% certain. We could be wrong about those things. And from that, we gleam some of our some of our understanding, or the presuppositionalists gleam some of their understanding about uh, the attributes of God. So, uh, one arg one argument is um, they claim that God has gifted us the reason, uh, uh, the ability to reason uh, and and logic to render the world we live in intelligible, but. If God gave us our very reason that allows us to recognize him, how can we know that we can trust it? 
After all, it is, his, it is the operating system that we start off with saying, yes, we acknowledge, we know, it's clear, or we see the Bible, or that we look at the transcendental argument. But it is his operating system that he gave us. It's a rigged game. Okay, so uh, next, um, the Christian God is true because of the impossibility of the contrary, is the allegation. Well, the contrary represents all possible worldviews, minus one, the Christian God. Let's examine just one world, alternative worldview then. For example, the world is exactly the way you guys say it is, uh, save one fact. God is all-knowing, except he does not know why Teflon if not, it doesn't stick to anything, how does it stick to the pan? How does that happen? I don't get it either. How is this world impossible? And if this example is not different enough, then maybe God doesn't know two facts or three. We can draw it out from there. This world is perfectly possible. And it invalidates the claim that, the, that all uh, contrary positions are impossible. And this is uh, the crux of the, the uh, transcendental argument for God. All of my arguments do not have to succeed in order for presuppositionalism to be false. If even a single argument turns out to be sound, presuppositionalism cannot stand. This is not true of most other worldviews, even most other Christian worldviews. They are far more defensible because they do not claim to know for certain that God exists. They have faith. You see, this is the weakness of this position. It claims there is no alternative explanation that is even possible. A claim this grandiose cannot hope to sustain even a small amount of criticism. Presuppositionalism is a house of cards. I get the attraction of believing in the presuppositional message. The naturalist worldview is complicated. It's packed so tightly, often with confusing and complex information. How can we take it all in without being paralyzed by the immensity of it all? On top of this, we are plagued by seemingly unanswerable questions about knowledge and about our place in the universe. Moral questions require dense ethical theories to make sense of. Asserting, asserting a certain God, sorry, asserting a, a certainty that God exists and that the Bible can answer all of these hard questions is almost irresistible. But I assure you, God does not simplify these questions. He complicates them. He posits dozens of extra assumptions that, need, that we need not. He presents contradictions compounded by inconsistencies, or at the very least, apparent contradictions, as Bruce has shared many. The Bible, even if inerrant, cannot be a reliable source of knowledge due to, uh, due to foundational problems with biblical interpretation. The God defended by our debaters, when carefully considered, cannot be rendered intelligible. The contradictions and inconsistencies are simply too many. That's all I've got, so I will uh, go ahead and... Uh, can, we, can we pull over the, the, my remaining time to the questions? Sure, thank you very much. Thanks, this Chris. time you'll have five minutes for cross-examination. I have a, a question. You know, the, it's been brought up a couple times, all the other religions. And, of course, this is not an, a debate between various religions. It's a debate between atheists and, and, and Christians, the triune God. But having said that, there seems to be this opinion among atheists that they just believe in one less God than what we believe in. And it sounds clever, but let me ask you a question. Do you, um, do you think that it's possible for a math question, a difficult math question, to have many wrong answers when people try to calculate? Is that possible? Many wrong answers? Yes. 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 Um, would it be reasonable then to say that basically when you talk about math, there is one right answer? Yes. Most of the time. Right. Just basic math. We're not talking about common core. 
Well, I got four semesters of calculus, so. By the way, Bruce, you look way better without your beard. I, have, I like that. Less evil. I love the beard. You should have yeah. kept uh, it. Uh, 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 beards are. You got a contradiction are, right there. I'm going to argue that. Yeah. Um, going back to my math question, does it follow then reasonably, since there are many wrong answers, one right answer, that that there is possibly no right answer to a math question? Well, that's a great question. Sorry. Well, that's a great question. Um, so the, the, my first point I would like to make is that uh, the debate tonight is also about the attributes of God, which, if in question, open up all possible gods. So they are all on the table right now in the view of um, soft atheism. So uh, to answer your, the next part of your question, um, it's a, it's a bad analogy because mathematics represent an internal truth within itself because you assume certain axioms and then you work through certain truths from that. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily tell us things about the world. Right, but wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that either there is a god or there is no god or that there are many false gods? I mean, isn't that what we're talking about? There's, there's either no god, one god, or many gods. Right. Yes. So it doesn't, it doesn't follow then that because there are many gods that it makes more sense that there be no god. It does follow that because they all are in contradiction with each other. Can I go? Uh, no. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, quick question, just, just to kind of work through these. I'll do my best to go quickly and just answer quickly if I could. Thank you. Uh, uh, you said that we use Pascal's wager. When? When did I say it, or when did you no, use when it? No, did when did we use that argument? We, we actually hate that argument. Yeah. I think it's terrible. Oh, okay, so, good. Uh, I, it was my impression that you used it when appealing to... Okay, so we didn't, in fact, save, make that Saving claim. other people from hell, okay, and but, that, is an encourage, that is an encouraging way to influence people. Yeah, but that's not Pascal's wager, though. Yeah. That's, not, in fact, not Pascal's wager. Okay, you made the claim, it may just be logic just exists... Correct? Oh, yes. So if we were to say from the Christian perspective, God just exists, would you accept that as an atheist? I wouldn't accept it, no. Yes. But uh, to say okay, that... Okay, you, you asked the uh, next question. We've got to go fast here, my friend. Uh, you said logic may not be absolute. Is it true? It's possible, yes. So it's not possible? No, it's possible. So it is not possible? Possibility is not rendered by absolutism. So possibility is rendered by absolutism. Possibility is not rendered by absolutism. It is. No, it, because, just because you have contradictions uh, does, does not mean that you have to abide so by So you don't actually believe your claim. Um, no, I do believe my claim. I've, I actually, and I gave, I gave you, you, uh, you plenty of, I've gave you plenty of evidence why that claim is you, perfectly You mentioned um, quickly that laws of logic may, are just conventional. Yes. Okay, so if society determines different laws of logic where you can contradict yourself, that would be appropriate for you? I'm sorry, say again? If a, a society determines by convention that you, it's perfectly okay and acceptable to contradict yourself, would you accept that? Uh, if logic is a convention, that's entirely possible, yes. So it's possible for society to say uh, illogical things and contradictions, and that's acceptable by convention. It's, it would be relative to the community defining what the logical convention is. So logic can change over time. Logic can change, yes, over time. And Thank you. So you mentioned that these couple guys came along recently and came up with the uh, transcendental or presuppositional school of thought. Can I ask you if you know when the book of Proverbs was written? Uh, 2,000 years ago? Could I, I have okay. one question, because we're almost out of time, if you don't mind, Jeff. Yeah. Could I ask you just one question? What evidence would it take to convince you of the God who says you already have enough evidence? I got one. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. Two minutes. If uh, we woke up tomorrow and there were two moons, and the moon was revolving like tidally locked uh, moon that we have now, and it started revolving, and on the other side it said, God in Hebrew. I think you misunderstood the question, but I, I what would, imagine that What would convince me that a God exists? No, no. Which evidence would convince you of the God who says you already have enough evidence? What evidence could convince you of that God? Logically, it would be impossible. I'm sorry, That's I don't the understand point. the question. Enough evidence? That's fine. That's fine. Unless we have time. What evidence could convince you of the God who says you already have enough evidence? 
I, I don't know. What, what evidence would uh, convince you of the dragon that. that already told you that he exists? What, what evidence would convince me of that? Is yes. that your world? You're, just a, you're, you're smuggling in this assertion that God has already given us evidence. Right. <laughs> Which, and I, I, have not, I have not had a revelation from God. Can, can I, so, this has come up a lot, and if okay. we're allowed to just continue at least for another 10 seconds, this has come up a lot, and I just want to make sure I respectfully say to you, because it seems unfair just to say, yes, you do, no, I don't, yes, you do, no, I don't. The point is, is, that, is that you're evidencing dependence upon your creator, because though you profess we that he does not creator, exist, though. you are appealing to uniformity, laws of logic, you ethical are absolutes, to as well. and we're saying it's a violation of your own professed view of mm -hmm. the world, so you are evidencing dependence upon him. Yes, yes. But you didn't justify that. Saying something doesn't justify but it. But you're doing it right now. No, no, you're, you're, you're just saying You're assuming uniformity, you're, you're assuming you're just, laws of logic, ab that. ethical absolutes. This does not prove God. Or are you ready? Am I allowed not. to choke you to win the debate tonight? Uh, yes, you would, you would be winning morally, the debate. But if I, am if I, I morally choke. allowed? Is that how you win you, debates? Real, real quick. Yes or are no? We talking, do you win debates by force? Okay, how, how often and how far do you want to keep shifting the goalposts here? We were, just, we were talking about once the that question, you just If you could just answer the question, it'd be great. No. Can you, can, is it appropriate? It on no, it's not appropriate. Time, it's not appropriate. gentlemen. So that violates your own position. At this time, Sean Taylor will be given 10 minutes to give closing arguments and summation. There will be no cross-examination. Thank you all. I'm having a harder time of this than most of you are probably. I'm just going to not uh, go off of anything uh, pre-written. I hope you don't mind. I'm, I'm still confused. Uh, I, I thought that, uh, that we were going to... <laughs> it's adorable. Um, I, I thought that they were going to have a debate here. But what they've done so far is said, I win, you can't think, you can't be moral, and we win. We don't have to show it because just you being here proves it. They started with saying something doesn't justify it. That's right. We have some neutral ground there. I agree with that. Saying something does not justify it. Just saying that God exists does not prove that God exists. Defining God in such a way that it answers the problems of the infinite regress, which philosophy has still not answered. Philosophers are still dealing with the infinite regress. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know you are wearing a hat? Well, because I can see a hat. I can feel a hat. Well, how do you know that? Can your senses be fooled? Can your senses... We can keep playing this game. You're going to get to a point eventually to where, well, that's not something I can justify. We all have presuppositions at a base level. We all have assumptions at the base level. Apparently, we agree that that logic it exists, it works. We, we seem to think that logic is a, is a different type of thing. They seem to think it, is, it actually has some sort of existence. Um, I, it, it doesn't. It is a concept. Logic is a concept. It is just a concept, just like math, just like English, just like many different God concepts that you don't believe in. These are concepts. There's Just because we can conceptualize something does not mean it therefore exists. I have a worldview. My worldview has changed throughout my life, sometimes drastically, sometimes very gradually. We all have worldviews. Most of us haven't really thought it and spelled it all out in epistemological terms and so forth, but we all have a certain worldview, a way that we deal with the reality that we find ourselves in. Now, when we play this philosophical game of infinite regress, we can find, we can play with the idea that maybe we're all in the matrix, if you've seen that movie, or a brain in a vat, as I think has been said tonight. It could be that you're just plugged into the matrix, and this is not the ultimate reality. There could be another reality. Well, I have no evidence that I am in the matrix. I do find myself existing in this reality, and I have to deal with that reality accordingly. Logic and reason, and so forth, there are certain things that we can come to trust because of their continued reliability in efficiently and correctly showing us how this reality works and what is in this reality. We know that water goes downhill. I can say, I know that water goes downhill. 
Even if I don't know about gravity or how gravity works, I can say that I know water goes downhill without knowing the properties behind it or the reasons why it happens. Some, someone else that doesn't know could say, obviously it's magic, or obviously God always wants water to head downhill. That could be an answer. If they don't know about gravity, that answer is, will suffice, that a God wants water to always go downhill. But just because that answer suffices in explaining things sufficiently for them does not make it true. My worldview is open to change. My worldview is open to the existence of God. There's nothing in this reality that I find myself in that convinces me a God is necessary or that a God exists. I am very, very open. It's the reason I'm here tonight and continue to do these things and have open discussions. I was not indoctrinated as a child myself. Most atheists come from belief of some sort. I was one of those rare few that I've just never believed. I have since studied much of it. I've, I've, I've gone to seminary school. I've, I've done a number of things. I've studied the Bible. I've studied the Quran. I've read few of the Hadith. I'm interested. My worldview is incredibly open to the existence of God, including whichever God it is that makes logic necessary in some way. That answer gives them a foundation. I get that. It, it works the way they're saying it, but it doesn't justify it. It doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean he exists. It's not evidence that he exists. Just saying it doesn't justify it. That's Jeff's words. I agree with them. I'm incredibly open to the idea of God, the existence of God. My worldview can change. And all worldviews should be allowed to change. If you learn that something doesn't fit or something does fit, fine, take it on. Try it out. See how it works. If you think that you have it right, look at the other side. Try that out for a while just to make sure you do have it right. Look at their arguments. Look at their evidence. Test your own theories and ideas and worldviews of how the world works. If you don't, you will often find yourself into trouble. If you believe the wrong things, if you believe that gravity does not exist or is much less powerful than it is on this planet, you may just jump off a building thinking you might be okay. You want to test things. You want to know and believe as many true things as possible. Now, I'm, again, I'm happy to say I know that water goes downhill. Could I be wrong about that? Yeah, yeah. I suppose if I, if I was plugged into the matrix in, in the ultimate absolute certainty sense, yes. But that's not what I'm talking about, is it? When I say I know water goes downhill. Because in this reality that I have to deal with, that I find myself in, I know water goes downhill. Could you be wrong about that? Yes, yes, we can play this game all day long. It doesn't prove anything. You can prove my worldview to be just buffoonish, absolutely inconsistent, incorrect, and, and I, how in the world am I still alive thinking that the world wakes, works the way it does? You could just be baffled by that. How is this guy still alive? His worldview is so wrong but in no way does that make your worldview correct. Proving someone else's worldview wrong, asserting that I know things that I don't know or believe things that I don't believe or I'm suppressing things or lying about things, just asserting these things, again, without providing any evidence that I am, doesn't do anything to prove your own worldview correct. So I two implore all minutes. of you. Did you say two? Two minutes? Two minutes. I implore all of you, try something else out for a while. There was a pastor recently that tried atheism for a year. He said, I'll just try atheism for a year, just to see what the world looks like through those, through those eyes. Try it. Try it if you want. I'm happy to go inside their worldview and see if it works. Does it work? Yeah, it works. Does it mean it's true? 
No. Is there any evidence to support it? Anything to justify it? No. Well, all right. It's, my worldview is working fine. I, I'm not convinced. I'm, I'm just not there yet. Again, my worldview is open to it, though. And everyone here's worldview should be as well. And that's the only thing I have to say. Thank you. At this time, Pastor Paul Vigiano will have 10 minutes for closing and summary. Good evening. There was a rather cynical comment on the thread of a local newspaper running a piece on this particular debate. The comment was, at the end of the event, everyone will go home with the exact same views they arrived with, <laughs> smug with the knowledge that they are right. I would like to think that to be false. Perhaps I'm hoping against hope that major transformations will take place, that the light of Christ will shine in the hearts of our esteemed opponents and guests. And I'm not saying that in any condescending or patronizing way. I, I, I would rejoice. I mean, I would rejoice. I would, I'd go home. I'm Italian, so I'd probably go home crying <laughs> if that were to take place. And I am firmly convinced that God is capable of such things, of, of softening stony hearts. But I would like to conclude this evening highlighting two things. First, the flawed nature of the request of my atheistic friends. When they require God to do certain things to overcome their disbelief. I want to address that, what they're requiring of God to overcome their disbelief. And finally what we are all called to do in light of the information that we actually do have. First, you will continually hear atheists emphasize sound thinking. They believe in logic. They believe in critical thinking and science. But they say this as if the finest thinkers in history, from Augustine to Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Hodge, Jonathan Edwards, who is generally regarded by secularists and theists alike as the finest mind to grace North American soil ever, as if they are not engaged in critical thinking and logic and science. Be that as it may, couched in their professed sound thinking is the demand that God, and you've heard it so many times, that God provide evidence and, and when one asks what kind of evidence they require, they'll mention things like the splitting of the moon, the rearranging of the stars, the elevating I've heard of the pulpit, the healing of the sick. They'll say, this is what I need to see. This is what I require. Numerous times I've asked my atheistic friends, how would these things prove to you the existence of God? How would you know these things are not merely tricks? Are the power of aliens, or the Russians, <laughs> or some other undiscovered phenomena? To this, the question I've heard one of our esteemed guests answer. He said, of course, I would have to exhaust the possibility of natural phenomena. But at least it would be a step in the right direction. If I got up and saw two moons, at least it would be a step in the right direction. But of course, I would have to exhaust all the possibility of natural phenomena. But how long would that take? to exhaust all the potential natural reasons for a second moon. I'm sure he would be on the phone with his favorite astrophysicist. Why is there two moons? He'd say, well, our moon was pregnant, as it so happened. <laughs> Gave birth. But it would take a lifetime. It would take 10 lifetimes. I submit that never in this life would they draw the conclusion that this affirms the existence of God via our own limited ability to investigate. We would never get there. Of course, and I don't want to sound patronizing again or condescending, if my atheistic friends truly grasped the nature of metaphysics, ethics, and epistemology, and by that I mean what is real, what is right, and how we know these things, they would realize that the mere scientific method, the cold construct of logic, and their, lo their own limited ability to think critically Things, by the way, I firmly believe should be employed in this life, but they will never lead them to the source or basis of the very disciplines they tout. Simply put, 
the scientific method cannot lead to the truth about the scientific method. Let me explain, because you hear this all the time. The empiricist, that's the scientist, is fond of saying, I will only believe in that which is testable, measurable, observable, repeatable. Or even more simply put, I only believe in what I see. But of course, the very statement, I only believe in what I see, is an immaterial concept. So the moment you say, I only believe in what I see, you've contradicted yourself. You've engaged in a self-refuting life and worldview which must be abandoned. I would like to parenthetically add here that faith, we hear this word faith, the word faith and belief in scripture are the same words. The word in the noun is pistis or the verb form is pistuo. And these words do not mean as been suggested and even some English dictionaries might offer quote, belief that is not based on proof, or even belief against sound evidence. That's not what belief or faith means. What a person believes, at least in this sense, is their starting point for inquiry. It is what they hold to be true a priori. It is what they believe before they believe anything else. And it cannot be improved empirically. It cannot be proved any other way because whatever you would use to prove it would become your new a priori. It would become your new presupposition. You see, what we believe is the means by which we evaluate other claims of metaphysics and ethics and epistemology and everything else for that matter. When our opponents say they believe in science, they believe in critical thinking and logic, they are stating their a priori convictions, that they are men of faith who, respectfully stated, I hope, have no authoritative, clear, or professed basis for the faith they so vehemently espouse. But they are men of faith. Be that as it may, we all believe in many things we do not see. Time and energy, space, mass, subatomic particles, love, courage, justice, virtue. These are necessary realities we all know to exist, yet we see none of them. Yet we know they exist, even though we don't see them. And I might add that the most plausible explanation for the reality we do observe is the acknowledgement of and acquiescence to an eternal self-existent God from whom all things come. It explains everything. I know they don't like that answer, but that is the answer. And it explains everything, material and immaterial. And without him, nothing can be explained. As Dr. Bonson posited, the proof for the existence of God is that apart from acknowledging God, you can't prove anything at all. All this to say, I'm not against marching out the evidence and throwing my bags of it on the table. But then they'll just plop their evidence on the table, and this will continue ad nauseum. And the cynical thread comment that I read at the beginning will just prove true. The same will occur if seeking to engage their false understanding and criticisms of biblical ethics and their shallow accusations against of, of biblical contradictions, of which there are none, if one really studies logic and understands the literary genres of the scriptures. There are no contradictions. Allow me to inform you why I'm not all that concerned with empirically proving my theological convictions. For example, yes, as, an, as an apologist, I have a degree in apologetics, and I went to a seminary that taught evidential apologetics. And they would argue about the proof of the resurrection. But I'm not, con I'm not all that concerned with proving that Jesus resurrected by some historical evidences. You know why? Because there were guards who were there, and they saw the resurrected Christ, and it meant nothing to them. What point is it if it didn't do anything for them? In fact, it can easily be argued that the two generations in Scripture who saw the greatest number of signs and wonders during the time of Moses and Jesus, were the most stiff-necked and hard-hearted people in the history of the redemptive account. They saw the most miracles, and they were the most hard-hearted. Jesus has said it in so many words. It's an evil and adulterous people who look for a sign. My friends, the atheist demands for evidence is a flawed request. But they have a legitimate desire that God would make himself known. But if signs, wonders, evidence, scientific and philosophical inquiry will not suffer, suff, suffice, what will? What is the most reasonable, in fact, the only reasonable dilemma of the ignorance on the part of the creature? What is the answer to that? 
They so dislike this answer, but it's been so many times. It's reasonable and it's universal that God has revealed himself to us and manifested the truth of his existence in us. He's shown it to us outwardly and inwardly, as Romans 1 indicates, with absolute certainty. It is not through evidences. It is not even through the discursive reasoning of intelligent design as if God is found at the end of our calculations. It is self-evident. It is something the creature can't not know. Two minutes. Yet, it is in our nature to push it down. And that's what, my friends over here, that's what's happening. That Greek word, to push down, is in the present active part. It's the idea of holding it down, like holding a basketball underwater. It's continually pressing it down. Dr. Bonson did his doctoral dissertation on self-deception, that you just can deceive yourself. And the longer you do, the harder it is to see clearly. As a Christian and as an apologist, I must say that though I have a degree in apologetics, I simply view apologetics as a means to clear the smoke out of the room. I much prefer to bring the good news. It says here, preach the word. My point, and my final point, is that in light of the information we do have, God has graciously called us to embrace the redemption found in Christ. A holy and righteous God cannot deny his own justice, but because of the great love with which he has loved sinners, he poured out the due penalty for our sins upon his Son, that we might stand righteous before him. This is the announcement of the gospel. I was observing an interesting dialogue my brother Sai here was having with one of his detractors. The man kept demanding indexical and dectic linguistic verification for Sai's commitment to scripture. It was as if these things were the man's master, demanding to be satisfied. He was seeking to convince Sai that if Sai could merely propitiate his master's demands, he would forsake them and believe in the Christ of scripture. But friends, if one has such a tenuous relationship with that which governs their heart that they would abandon it so readily, is it really to be trusted in the first place? And what do these things offer in return for your worship? Can they, offer, they can't offer truth nor redemption. One of the greatest minds in the first thousand years of the New Covenant Church, maybe the greatest mind period, was Augustine of Hippo. It was with extreme intellectual and theological acumen that he uttered, credo ut intelligum, I believe in order that I might understand. We have the option of believing in the weak and shifting sands of human disciplines that change like the tide or the eternal, timeless words of Christ regarding himself, which yields access to understanding, the understanding of all things and true and eternal life. Time. Please give a hand to all of our speakers tonight.